papers said bring the Mexicans in 1942 the men have left the fields for the war and there's too much work to do north came El Bracero to work the fields and grow the food for the troops the allies and the nation truly a part of the greatest generation see the sack of potatoes basket full of tomatoes see the man bending down with the short handle hoe this is a song for El Bracero Paid by the sack or the bushel Never paid by the hour Never get that shower At the end of a long hot day Paid with only a coupon He was supposed to rely on To exchange for cash At the bank back in Mexico See the sack of potatoes Basket full of tomatoes See the man bending down with a short-handled hoe This is a song for El Bracero Twenty-eight near the Canyon de los Gatos Fourteen when the truck van exploded Thirty-two when the train hit that bus we died without our name. Bracero Memorial Highway from Soledad to Chula through the fields where we worked and slept beneath the stars. La Bosa de Papa La cesta de tomate There al hombre agachado con su corto as don Esta es un canción para el bracero Good morning I'm James Perry, and I'm the curator and director of the Monterey County Historical Society. We're so very grateful to have all of you here today celebrating a magnificent human being in so many different respects. So it's great to have you, and I would like to present Maria Orozco for our welcome. We'd like to welcome you this morning to the celebration of life of our good friend Juan. Gary will uh, be up here shortly to introduce uh, our special guest. Uh, I also want to take a moment to thank our committee uh, for making this possible. Um, Wes White, thank you very much. You, uh, Salvador Munoz, our friend Lupe Covarrubias Martinez, who could not be here with us this morning. Tony Stark, thank you. Uh, and James Perry, thank you. Nancy Drenian, thank you. Uh, and Dorothy Cabana, who's not here, but who also was part of our committee. And, um, pardon? Dorothy's, oh, Dorothy, she just showed up, oh, let's see her. Thank you, Dorothy. Uh, and uh, once again, Karen Aruajo, and uh, it would not be possible without the efforts of all of these folks. So, Gary, thank you very much. Thank you for coming, everybody. Um, this is a uh, celebration of life for our good friend and compadre Juan Martinez. Um, we have uh, many of his uh, historical collection here. 
Um, and we're going to ask people at some point to help us preserve Juan's collection. And the way to do that before you leave today is to check in at the table over there, and, and we'll let you know how you can help um, preserve the history of activism, Juan's life, of the Salinas Valley primarily. And it's something that needs a permanent home. It's something that uh, we were able to, that Juan gave us, and we have a solemn oath that we would do the right thing, preserve that, and make it available to the public. Because, you know, we constantly, as people who are trying to change the world for the better, we're always fighting for the future, for the next generation. But part of what we do is also fight for our past. We have to keep our past. We do, and you know what's going on in this country in terms of what people think is the correct history. This is the part of the correct history. We made it, Juan made it, Juan saved it. So we're going to need your help preserving it, and there's a way to do that. So before you leave, I want you to check in over there. Um, I also am going to, um, we also have a biography or a story of life that we were able to put together of Juan. We also have those, so please stop by and get that before you leave. And I'm going to come back later and and what I'm going to share a story, a three-minute story about one. It's called Juan Martinez and the Three Little Pigs. Does anyone know about that story? Monica knows about that story. It's very funny. It's something that uh, former Senator Bill Monty, who worked with Juan at CRLA and on many campaigns, um, Juan, uh, Bill could not be with us today, but he wrote up that story, and it's a great story about Juan and who he was and who he is today. So please, before you leave, check in at the table back over there with us, okay? Thank you very much. I also want to introduce another friend of, of Juan's, uh, Joel Rafael, who's here from uh, uh, the other end of California, came up today to be with us to honor Juan's life. Uh, Joel is a longtime, lifelong musician, songwriter, um, and Joel's going to explain more about himself and how he was, he and Juan participated in a, uh, the Song for Caesar documentary. And hope, is this Abel? Abel. I Abel, Abel Sanchez is here too. I hope you two don't leave. You guys don't want you to be able to get up and talk about Juan from your perspective before we uh, conclude the, the event today. Um, more about the Song for Caesar and and how Juan Martinez um, was included and participated uh, in that documentary. So staff members from our elected officials who have material to present to Juan's family for his accomplishments and for his life history. I'm Susie Brusa, and I'm the district director for Congressman Jimmy Panetta. It's an honor to be here on the congressman's behalf to speak about the remembering the life and the service of one of California's native sons, Juan Martinez. As the federal representative for the Valley and for the people who work in it, Congressman Panetta looked to community leaders like Juan as a North Star for improving the lives of farm workers across our community. Among Juan's many achievements that make up what will be his enduring legacy, he pursued better working conditions, protections for farm workers against pesticides, and paved the way for the fund to create the Brasero Memorial Highway. Juan's tireless work documenting and archiving and preserving farm worker history will live on here in Monterey and maybe at the Smithsonian but it also will live in the halls of Congress as we continue to fight for legislation and policy that recognizes the commitment and the contributions that farm workers in the Valley make to our economy, to our culture, and to our community. Today we remember Juan's vibrant life and the, the vibrant life that he and his family led here on the Central Coast. But tomorrow and every day after this, his legacy of activism and archiving will continue to serve and benefit the people of our valley. I have here also a congressional record that the congressman read into the congressional record about Juan and about his life that I will put over there so that you can see it, but it is for his family. Thank you so much. I met Juan um, in 2013 
there was an event in Fresno, California. Um, how many of you know of the song that Woody Guthrie wrote called Plane Wreck at Los Gatos? Okay, so that's, it's sometimes known by the name Deportes. And in 1948, Woody Guthrie wrote the song Plane Wreck at Los Gatos when he heard a radio report that uh, told of the tragedy um, over Los Gatos Canyon when the plane crashed. And it named the four crew members, but it, it just called the other 28 um, passengers deportees. And Woody Guthrie, being the kind of writer that he was, just felt that it was just uh, unjust and unfair for them not to have their names. Um, and so he wrote the song, and as you know, the, the chorus goes, Goodbye to my Juan, goodbye Rosalita, adios mis amigos, Jesus y Maria. You won't have a name when you ride the big airplane. All they will call you will be deportees. Well, in 2013, I had two friends that lived over in Fresno, and that they figured out that the, the Chicano community knew about the grave at Holy Cross Cemetery that had 28 Mexican nationals buried in a mass grave with a small marker that said 28 Mexican nationals buried here. Um, and, and the musical community knew about the song that Woody had written, but they not really made the connection until these two guys figured out, wow, those people are the same people from Woody's song. And so they started an effort to find the names. And it wasn't that hard. There were newspaper articles and there were uh, records at the, at the cemetery. Um, but all the names were, you know, anglicized spellings. And they went through and corrected that and figured out what the names were. And then one of the, the guys, and Lance Canales is the songwriter, and the other guy's name is Tim Hernandez. He's an author. Uh, he placed an article in the Fresno newspaper, you know, asking if anyone knew of anyone that had been uh, in that crash, had a relative or a friend or knew of anything having to do with the plane wreck at Los Gatos. And he didn't hear anything, but about two weeks later, he got a call from a guy named Jaime Ramirez, who lives in Fresno. And he said, yeah, my grandfather and my uncle were on that plane. And uh, he said, my friend said, well, where do you live? He said, well, I'm here in Fresno. I've got a restaurant called Ole Frioli. And he said, uh, and my friend said, well, <laughs> That's amazing, I've been eating there since I was five years old. And so he went over and met Jaime, and they went out to the site, and uh, they organized a huge uh, ceremony at the Holy Cross Cemetery, um, where they placed a eight by four, four by eight granite headstone with all of the names of the victims and of, of the crew members with falling leaves, um, as is written in Woody's song. Uh, and they had a huge uh, mariachi mass there. And that's where I met, met Juan. And when I ran into Juan, we were sitting at Oli Frioli's the night before, and because uh, there was a get together there, and, and I said to him, boy, it's really awesome that Woody Guthrie wrote this song in 1948 so that these people could get their names back. And he said, uh, yeah. He said, did you know about the 14 people that uh, the 14 Braceros that died when a makeshift transportation vehicle blew up. I said, no, didn't know about that. He said, did you know about the 32 Braceros that died when a train hit the bus that was parked on a railroad track in Gonzales, California? I said, no, I didn't know about that. He said, that's because nobody wrote a song about those. <laughs> and so then he proceeded to tell me that the 28 victims in Woody's song were Braceros. Um, not, not undocumented workers, but they were here on contract, working in the United States. And so um, that's how we met. And then um, he said that they were going to have an event two weeks later here in Salinas at the Steinbeck Center where they were going to be dedicating the Bracero Memorial Highway, a section of the Highway 101 between Chular and Soledad. And um, if I could, I should come to it. And I said, well, you know, I'm going to be at a wedding up in, in Ukiah, and, and, and I'll come down that weekend. We'll be on our way down the day of your event, so we'll stop by. And so we stopped at the event. It was supposed to start at 4.30 on, on the paper we had, but when we got there, it turned out it started at 4. So we were about a half hour late. We came in, and a couple of young people came over. They saw us and said, oh, better get some chairs for them. And they set us up in the back on a couple of seats because the place was packed. If anybody of you, some of you were there probably. But um, I saw Juan up in the front, you know, all dressed up in his black suit. Boy, he looked really good, really looked sharp, you know. And uh, 
you know, kind of kidding my wife about it. Wow, you know, he cleans up good, you know. And then all of a sudden he spotted us, you know, and he headed back to the back of the room. And right about then my wife was reading the program and saw my name on the program. And Juan says, oh, I'm glad you made it. I put you on the program. And right then is when um, the lady who was hosting the program announced my name. <laughs> of course, I didn't have a guitar with me. <laughs> so I sang uh, Deportees, Plain Record Los Gatos, a cappella. And uh, then after the event, Juan educated me about the Bracero program and showed me all of his uh, collection and archival stuff that he had set around the room. And I went home and I wrote a song about it called El Bracero. A little while after that, Abel Sanchez and his partner, Andres, came to uh, my, my office of my manager because they had heard or they knew about a song that, that Crosby Nash had recorded called Field Worker that they wanted to use in their movie. And so my manager said, yeah, yeah, Graham will let you use that, but um, you know, we have another artist that just wrote a song recently called El Bracero about the Bracero Project. And so they checked out the song and they decided to use that too. I told them they could use the instrumental part and the, the regular track. And then uh, I asked them if, if they knew Juan Martinez. And they said, no. I said, well, you've got to talk to him. He knew Caesar. And so that's how Juan Martinez and Joel Raphael ended up in a movie, uh, a wonderful movie that you all should see called A Song for Caesar, um, produced and, and directed by Andres Alegria and Abel Sanchez made this movie. I think it took you guys about 14 years to make it. But um, I'm going to play that uh, the song from the movie for you right now. So former Senator Bill Monty gives his apologies, apologies that he could not join us today. Um, he was at Juan's funeral and uh, spoke there. Um, and Bill and Juan worked together as California Rural Legal Assistants and on various campaigns. On pesticide, pesticide reduction and uh, gained many uh, victories for the people in terms of health and safety and uh, agriculture in the Salinas Valley. But um, Bill gave me a, a short story about one to present today. Uh, I think it's a little humorous, um, you tell me. Um, uh, it's called uh, The Case of the Three Little Pigs. I think it was in the early 1990s when a big storm hit Central California. The winds blew hard, harder than the normal daily afternoon winds that blow through the Salinas Valley. These winds knocked down the trees, the power lines, and the fences. Livestock, including cattle and horses, had to be tracked down and rescued for return to their rightful owner. Most were returned without incident to their respective farm for each owner. One lived in the East Baranda district at the time on Hebert Road. A fence blew down on Juan's property and three little pigs that Juan was raising escaped out onto North and Tibidette Road. They were picked up and delivered to the SPCA and when Juan went to recover his livestock he was cited for a violation of an ordinance that made it illegal not to contain one's livestock. Juan faced misdemeanor charges in Salinas Municipal Court. He was the only resident of the Salinas Valley charged with a crime after the devastating work of Mother Nature with those destructive winds. Juan was offered the option to pay a fine, but he refused. Why should I pay a fine when the owners of the cows and horses were not fined? It's discrimination, pure and simple, was Juan's response. Local attorney Marjorie, Margie Cohen agreed to represent Juan in court. And on the day of his trial, Juan brought his three little pigs, who were no longer so little, to the Salinas courthouse. At first, the bailiffs didn't want to let Juan bring the pigs into the courthouse, but Juan had them on leashes and explained that they were evidence in his case. I think Juan referred to the three little pigs as his defendants. Juan brought the pigs into the courtroom, but that action received a strong rebuke from the judge who did not want to see his courtroom tuned in, turned into a circus. But Juan, with that mischievous smile of his, dutifully introduced the defendants as Chicharro, 
carnitas and chili verde. <laughs> Any, anyone waiting in the courtroom that day was a beneficiary of Juan's demonstration and plea of not guilty, Your Honor, on the basis of discriminatory enforcement of the law. Judge Moreno, wanting to end the demonstration and avoid having to clean the floors of the courtroom, <laughs> quickly dismissed the charges against Juan and simply um, admonished him to fortify his fences so as not to endanger the lives of his pigs in the future. Sometime later, as I recall, it was a fun barbacoa organized in the backyard at Juan's property that served as the, as the ultimate demise of Juan's three little pigs, Carnitas, Chicharron, and Chili Verde. Muy sabroso. Gracias. I have copies of this for people. But before you leave, I have the life story of one on one page and the three little pigs on the other side. We have a copy for you. You know, it's a weird obligation where I'm supposed to speak on behalf of my boss, Robert Rivas, here today. Uh, but a lot of this is going to come from me because, you know, I grew up around Juan Martinez. I grew up around a lot of you troublemakers here. You know, whether it's Olga Rain over there, the Pinedas, a lot of you here, Pete Maturino. You know, one of the greatest legacies I think Juan Martinez offers us here today is to show the strength and the diversity of the community that exists. It's not just activists here who talked about pesticides. It's just not unions who talked about farm worker rights rights in the workplace. It's car clubs who went through their own struggles. And soon, we might see those cars on Main Street again. Thank you. <laughs> but the people he brought from throughout the community need to remind us that we can't remain in our silos. We have to work throughout our community. It's not just fighting for the people who do the work every day. It's not just fighting for the people who tried to represent it. a different kind of culture barely is going to be included in our history books. It's making sure we talk to all of the community. Because in all of that community is where the strength is found. And that was Juan's gift. No matter when you talk to Juan, he never seemed out of history. While he always promoted it, he was always relevant because he was always connected. I left for 20 years and when I came home, I felt out of place. I had no idea what was going on. Juan was one of the first people I talked to. Because even through sickness, even through bad times, Juan was always somebody who knew what was going on. The challenge that came from that, though, is if you ever picked up the phone when Juan called, you better have a half hour. Because Juan would always have about four ideas, and then that would lead to 15 more. And you'd feel bad, because you're like, man, those are really good ideas, but Juan, I, I got a life, too. But before I get to like Juan Martinez, they truly make a difference for the things that go on in our state. We talk about the people who send regards for Juan today. It's not just the folks here, we're talking about senators. We're talking about a banner where if you look at it, it's some of the who, who, who's who of California history. Juan was a voice who spoke in many years. And the best part about Juan was it always spoke about here, our Salinas Valley. He never forgot where he came from. He could have always been something bigger, but he always wanted to be from here. And for that, on behalf of Assemblymember Rivas, we certainly send our, our thanks to Juan for all he did throughout his lifetime. We won't miss him. with all of our legislative members, all of the amazing things that he did for our community. So if I could also have um, his family come, come here um, to receive not only our resolution from our legislative members, but um, this envelope from, from, from Senator Caballero as well. 
Thank you. And accepting is uh, Juan's brother-in-law, Bob, and also his niece. Uh, his daughter, Dominique, will probably be joining us shortly uh, today as well. Well, the crops are all in. Peaches are rotting, the oranges are filled in their creosote dumps. They're flying us back to the Mexican border to pay all that money and wait back again. My father's own father, he waited in that river. Took all the money that he made in his life My brothers and sisters come work in the fruit trees They rode the trucks till they took down and died Goodbye my one, goodbye Rosalita, adios mis amigos Hey, Susie Maria, you won't have a name when you ride the big airplane. All they will call you will be deportee. Some of us are not wanted, some are illegal. Our work contracts out and we have to move on. 600 miles to the Mexican border They chase us like outlaws, like rustlers, like thieves We died in your hills, we died in your orchards We died in your valleys, and we died on your plains we died beneath your trees and we died in your bushes Both sides of the river, we died just the same Goodbye to my one, goodbye Rosalita, adios mis amigos, Jesus y Maria won't have a name when you ride the big airplane All they will call you will be deportee Well the sky plane caught fire over Los Gatos Canyon Like a fireball of lightning it shook all our hills who are these friends, all scattered like dry leaves? The radio said they were just deportees. Is this the best way we can grow our big orchards? Is this the best way we can grow our good fruit? Fall like dry leaves and rot on your topsoil Be known by no name except deportee Goodbye to my one, goodbye Rosalita Adios, mis amigos, Jesus y Maria won't have a name when you ride the big airplane All they will call you will be deportee Goodbye to my one, goodbye Rosalita Adios mis amigos, Jesus y Maria won't have a name when you ride the big airplane All they will call you will be deportee
first of all, I'd like to thank uh, the Historical Society, uh, Maria, and uh, all the family and friends and relatives of Juan Martinez for his uh, celebration of life today. Um, Juan, like Maria said, was a member of our club back in the 70s, and he spent a few years in our club, uh, and he had to cut his career kind of short because he was so, and for those of us that know Juan now, was really involved in the Bracero UFW movement. He wanted to do the very best what he can do for the people, the Latino community here in Salinas Valley. And to his legacy today, all of this is because of what he's done in the past. So his time at our club wasn't really as much, but when he was there, he did his, uh, his due diligence and did well for our club. Now, I had the pleasure of meeting Juan back in uh, 2018, when we were planning our uh, 46 uh, reunion. And I, um, <laughs> he called me one day and he told me, hey, this is Juan Martinez. And I'm like, okay, uh, who is Juan Martinez? I go, I am a member of the New Rivals back in the 70s and so on and so on. I'd like to get together with you. I got some ideas and I want to talk to you. And I'm like, I'm thinking, who is this guy? And, uh, go, okay, Mr. Juan Martinez, uh, let's meet up one day. Um, that was my mistake. <laughs> I met Juan and uh, I thought it was going to be like a, about a five, ten minute um, conversation. It turned out to be a half hour to an hour. And I realized that Juan was so full of energy, ideas, goals. He had that in him, and I was like, you know what? Um, I was kind of intrigued by that because I'm like, dude, man, you got a lot of like, goals and ambitions and ideas here. He goes, yes, I've been doing it for many years. I'm going to continue to do it, continue to do it, and, and this is what I'm all about. And I'm going to express this and bring it to the attention of the club. And we welcomed him with open arms, and he was a good uh, member with us when we planned our reunion. And up until his, um, his very days, uh, you know, uh, I would be go there in Gonzales, I would see Bob, and I would drop him some burritos and uh, some vitamins, and um, for him to, you know, get well and survive with the situation he had. But even then, he was still full of energy. He is still full of ideas and goals. And I'm thinking, Juan, um, you do know that you're here in, in the bed, right? He goes, oh, no, no, I'm okay, I'm okay. I'm going to give me my burrito. Let's eat it. We'll have lunch. Fair enough. Let's do that, bro. Let's have our burritos and have lunch. But he was so full of that. And it's just, to his very last days, he was so full of that energy. And um, he will be missed. Uh, men like that come once in a lifetime. And to have his legacy from this point on going forward is uh, his efforts and diligence for what he's done in the past is going to prove forward, going forward, for not only the Latinos and the Braceros that have sacrificed their lives in the past, but for the whole community of Salinas in the Salinas Valley. So, you know, cutting it short, I know that we have a lot of speakers and I'd like to thank you for giving me the opportunity to come up here on behalf of our car club, James, and uh, Historical Society. And for the Martinez family, um, on behalf of the New Rivals Car Club, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity up here. Thoughts and prayers to everybody, Martinez family, everyone that is involved with Juan Martinez. Thank you so much for, for having this opportunity to come out here. And I wish you all the well. And you guys have a very good and safe uh, weekend. And uh, thoughts and prayers. And Juan Martinez, I know you're up there, and I wish you could join us. But you rest in peace, my good brother. And uh, until we meet again, my friend, thank you very much. So, notice, gracias. Another good friend of Juan who has worked with him throughout the years and have done many projects together, Salvador Munoz. I really miss Juan, but he's always present in my, in my heart. I met Juan on the Day of the Dead in Watsonville. And the Day of the Dead is when we welcome the spirits of our ancestors and we give offerings to them and learn from their past. That became the seed for Juan to preserve our history. That's when you see all the collectionists have passion to preserve that history of posterity. Then we got together. 
and, and he said, you know, Chava, because my name is Salvador, and he said, Chava, why don't we do something that we can invite the community to participate on preserving our history? Because all we all have a great past. So then, and, and then he said, well, why don't we start doing, celebrating El Grito, and, uh, Cinco de Mayo, and do exhibits so we can teach our children, especially those who are born in California, who because their parents are from Mexico, so they can immerse in their past history and then keep on writing it for future posterity. And he said, well, why don't we create, you know, like a, a champion? To me, you are the champion for the hero for preserving history. And then I said, well, l let me give you a little story. We have in our, we have in, in our area some heroes that are real and so are that are fiction. One of the fiction one who was, who was written by, by a writer in, in 1919, Johnston O'Neill, who wrote uh, about El Zorro at the times of the missions. So he will fight for, to preserve and get uh, and get the, 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 their land, their cattle, their riches back from those who take him away. So he became sort of like a Robin Hood. And then I told uh, Juan, Robin Hood didn't exist, it's a legend. But he, but this is, the real ones are like Chucho El Roto from Mexico who did exactly that. He was elegant and everything. And then we have in California another one. Who remember the great bandido of California? You don't remember? What's his name? Divorcio Vasquez. Divorcio Vasquez in our area. He did exactly the same thing as El Zorro or exactly the same thing as Chucho El Roto. They were very elegant, very eloquent poets and lovers. They will get cattle back to the right owners. They will rescue land and give it back to the rapture moments. They said, you know, Chava, we got something. So we created that. So I have a surprise for the family that this indeed happened. And guess what? One lives and he chose to dress on Dia de los Muertos, El Sol. <laughs> so we will celebrate <laughs> with El Sol. And in his memory, I'm going to sing a song that he liked that we sing during Dia de los Muertos, or Day of the Dead. And it's called La Llorona. Salías del templo un día, Llorona cuando al pasar yo te vi. Salías del templo un día, Llorona, cuando al pasar yo te vi. Hermoso y pil llevabas, Llorona, que la Virgen te creí. Hermoso y pil llevabas, Llorona, Lloronas, las flores de un campo santo. No sé qué tienen las flores, llorona, las flores de un campo santo. Que cuando las mueve el viento, llorona, parece que están llorando. Well, I just want to mention that in Gonzales we are going to, for on Dia de los Muertos, we are going to be having an altar for Juan. So if you have something that you, that you would like to contribute um, to the altar, please call me and let me know. Um, we will have, uh, we, it'll be, it'll take place in the park, in Centennial Park, um, for Dia de los Muertos. But, um, a couple good things happened to me during the pandemic. The movie, A Song for Caesar, got finished.
which was great because I had a song in that movie and it's got a great message and it's, it's like a master class uh, about uh, the forming of the U United Farm Workers and the music that that uh, that uh, motivated that whole effort. But I got lucky, I got another song in another movie, too. So I'll tell you about that one. It's called uh, Linda and the Mockingbirds. Anyone seen it? No. One, one person has. It, it's actually streaming on uh, Apple TV, the same place that A Song for Caesar is, but it also streams on Prime and on HBO Max. So it's on three different, three different formats right now. And it's uh, the Linda and the Linda and the Mockingbirds is Linda Ronstadt. And uh, the Mockingbirds, well, that's a group from the East Bay called Los Enzatlas. It's run by a guy named Eugene Rodriguez, who teaches kids in the, in the Chicano community about their uh, cultural songs and dances. And Linda Ronstadt is a, a patron of that group, Los Enzatlas. And at some point, Eugene said to Linda, I would really like to take these kids to Mexico so they can see what it's like, you know, to be in Mexico. And so she said, I can help with that. And so they arrange a trip with Linda Ronstadt, Eugene Rodriguez, and then all these kids that sing and dance the cultural songs that he's taught them and play the cultural instruments that he's taught them. And then Jackson Brown goes along for the ride. They take a bus down to Sonora, to the town where Linda Ronstadt's grandfather is from. And the movie is filled with wonderful songs and dance, and, um, and lots of interviews with Jackson Brown and Linda Ronstadt and the kids, the parents of the kids that are singing and dancing, and, and the, the guy who runs the academy. And in the last interview that they do with Jackson Brown, he says, do you think these people are coming north to steal our jobs? Do you think these people are coming to take something away from us? No, these people are leaving their homes. They're leaving everything they've known. They're leaving their culture and their families behind them. And then he says, much to my surprise, I have a friend named Joel Raphael who wrote this song. And I would play it for you, but I can't get through it. And then the director of the movie put my song in the movie. So check it out. It's called uh, Linda and the Mockingbirds, and check out a song for Caesar. But I'm going to play for you the song that's in Linda and the Mockingbirds. It's not a very happy song, but I think Juan would appreciate it. It tells a true story about um, 18 uh, undocumented workers that, that died in a boxcar in Sierra Blanca, Texas a bungled smuggling attempt. in my country for a better life I didn't even say goodbye to my friends not to my grandparents nor to my parents Rosario Caldera said as I said alone I cried there was no witness Only God knew my sorrow and shame And I didn't leave you one single cent And long I left my country in pain These are some words from the victims found Inside a boxcar in a small Texas town Locked from the outside in spite of their pleas In 
outside It was a hundred and thirty degrees Landing in Texas West Leco and Houston Dallas and San Antonio They all fit here inside of his heart Even though her borders are so far apart Que bonito Los Estados Unidos Illinois, California and Tennessee But over on the other side of the border a piece of the sky still belongs to me These are some words from the victims found inside a boxcar in a small Texas town. Locked from the outside in spite of their plea. Inside it was a hundred and thirty degree. I didn't even say goodbye to the boys. I drink to my friends like we used to do But now I'm out here way over the line Your friend the illegal still misses you Goodbye to El Paso Goodbye to Laredo When I crossed that big river on the route of a tree I never knew how soon I'd be yearning for the land that I love and my family These are some words from the victims found inside a boxcar in a small Texas town Locked from the outside in spite of their plea. Inside it was a hundred and thirty degree. Inside was a hundred and thirty degree. my big brother. He kept me out of trouble sometimes. And then we got in trouble for all the right reasons like John Lewis told us to do decades ago. Few will have the greatness of in history itself. Each time a person like Juan Martinez steps up to improve the love of others like he did for 50 years of his lifetime, like Bobby Kennedy told us long ago when he spoke in June of 1966 in South Africa. He sends a million different centuries and knocks down the mighty swells of oppression. Juan Martinez was there when the Berceros needed him as a kid when his dad was driving back to Gonzales in September of 1963. Juan Martinez was there in December of 1970 when Cesar Chavez needed him as a bodyguard, when all he was trying to do was improve the lives of people who work the hardest in our Salinas Valley each and every hour, each and every day, each and every year. Juan Martinez was there for his friends. Juan Martinez was there for housing for the poor people many years ago. Juan Martinez was there for the faculty, for the students at Hartnell College, and for me as a friend all the time. Juan Martinez was there for the Pesticide Coalition 
to make sure that the people that live near this farmland are safe each and every day. Juan Martinez was there for improving the water in South Monterey County. Juan Martinez was there for the homeless people of our community. Juan Martinez was there for everyone. He was like my big brother, like I said. There's one funny story of years ago, we went down to visit one of the granddaughters of the Hartnell College. And I never grew up on a farm. He was a farm boy from Gonzales. We're walking back to his car to come back to Salinas from Santa Barbara County on a ranch. I stupidly thought that the bulls would be behind the fence like they did are the rodeo. I was greatly mistaken, okay? I have a red Stanford jacket on and I'm petrified to no end. But here's what Juan Martinez did. He whistles at the bulls. I thought we're both dead meat. But the only thing they did to us before we left that ranch that morning to go back to Salinas is they gave us a funny look. They're not like the rodeo bulls at the rodeo. You know, I miss my, my big brother, my mentor, my hero. But I know he's looking down with us today. Thank you. I'd like, now, I'd like to now introduce Laura Barajas from the Farm Worker Movement. And, uh, you know, Juan was an activist. And uh, he, I don't think he ever missed one of the marches uh, honoring Cesar Chavez. And uh, Laura will share a few words about Juan and his involvement with the Braceros. Thank you. And the UFW. Thank you. I've been working with UFW for 27 years. And in those 27 years, we have done campaigns, strikes. present in all of that activity and <clears throat> he was like happy all the time it was not easy to I mean I never saw I never saw he angry or things like that he his, his way of talking smiling and uh, he didn't help me get in he pushed me in trouble. I remember when we had a one strike, and Juan was suggesting, "Why don't bring it, bring out what other ten, ten tokens?" <laughs> so, so he didn't want to leave one, he one ten or fifty. Um, so, uh, even though when he was sick, he used to come to our office. he was with cancer and put it sick, he will continue, continue, continue uh, to the very end. So, the um, Bracero program, we have it now under H2A. So, Los Gatos things is not over. Um, and I think that the challenge of uh, one is not just for us to be come here and talk in nice up again, but what is his example challenge us to do in favor of the community and in favor of the less people uh, with laws and things in favor. Um, so now with the uh, H2A program, workers get sick. And the companies tell them, well, what do you want to see? If you can get cured there, then you come back. If not, stay there. That's the same thing. You have no name. You're just a tool. And that's a shame for our community. Uh, same thing with the pesticides. 
pesticides. It's not, the pesticide is not just for the farm workers who are close by. We're eating the fruit, the vegetables. And that is in the air and the water and the, and the, and the ground. And whatever we do is going to be for these next generations. So for me, that's the example of a will be news to you as well, so I hope there are a few that haven't heard this before. <coughs> uh, and I'm not sure if everything I have to say is true to fact, but it's the way that I understand it, the way I remember it, so, and from what Juan had told me. But <laughs> so, uh, take it with a grain of salt, I guess. But anyway, when he was, I guess he was about 18 years old, he was working for Rural Legal Assistance, and, uh, you know, he didn't have any degree or anything. In fact, he told me that two weeks before graduation from high school, the, the principal kicked him out of school so he didn't even graduate from high school. But that didn't stop one. That didn't stop one. But, but at any rate, he was uh, uh, 18 years old working there at Rural Legal Assistance with all the lawyers. And they had a convention up in San Francisco so all the lawyers went up to San Francisco, and uh, one of the lawyers, uh, she had a daughter uh, that was with her, and asked Juan, hey, can you take care of my, my daughter, 16-year-old daughter? So Juan said, sure, I can do that. So all of the lawyers are in the, in the convention, and Juan tells this uh, young girl that he could take her to see San Francisco from a place that you get a whole different perspective of San Francisco. So they drive across the Golden Gate Bridge, go up to the top of the hill. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that. You get a great view of San Francisco up there. Well, anyway, the cops showed up, and they were wondering why this Hispanic uh, young man was doing with a, with a white teenage girl. And they arrested him on the spot, put him in jail, uh, no phone calls, nothing like that. Uh, the girl made it back to her mom, but uh, I don't know any of the details on that. But on Monday, court, the judge shows up, walks into the room, and says, who are all these people in this room? And they were all the lawyers, judges, case dismissed. <laughs> but still, uh, you know, one just things would happen with one that don't happen to other people that would just drive him nuts, but he just goes with the flow. Um, uh, now, a totally different thing, uh, yeah, uh, Amparo, his uh, sister and I, were, were, we were married for, I guess, uh, 37 years before she passed away, but we were living up in San Jose and raised our family up there. Oh yeah, he, he calls us up one day. And this was around 2008, 2009, something like that. And, and uh, tells Amparo, says, hey, I need, I need $90,000. And 
and we just kind of look at each other and says, $90,000. I don't even know if his sister even asked him what it was for. I said, okay, we can do that. So we go to the bank and uh, we refinance our, our loan, get the money. And I swear, the day that we get the money, Juan calls up and tells us he doesn't need the money. <laughs> so we're thinking, what the heck are we going to do now? Well, a friend of ours, Dorothy, I don't know, I understand she was here, but she was a, a realtor. She would take us around and uh, we'd go into Salinas and Gonzales and we'd see a house and say, yeah, we'd like that house. We'd get back to San Jose and uh, there had been 10 offers, half of them for cash, six or seven thousand dollars over asking. So, and this was at the time when the prices had all collapsed back and I think uh, a large number of the individuals buying property at that time, I think were the Japanese that were coming in and paying cash for everything. So we were looking at each other, what are we going to do? Well, Amparo just gets on the computer one day, and uh, we see this house that pops up in Gonzales, and I said, okay, let's just offer 6000 over asking, we won't even look at the house. Well, they accepted our offer, the house, and then we rented that place out uh, for a good number of years, and uh, the tenant was excellent, never had any trouble with rent or anything like that. So anyway, uh, Amparo passed away about, well, it's been five years. So I was living up in San Jose in this big house that I couldn't manage to take care of. So I sold the house and I moved down to Gonzales and uh, asked the renters, you know, gave them the notice and I took over the house. Well, that was the house that Juan basically was responsible for. And, and but anyway, to go back, when we bought the house, Juan was over there from the day that we moved into the house, fixing the house up, just going out of his way, just doing all kinds of really crazy stuff, rearranging cabinets to make the house just look so much better, and all this helped with the painting. He did everything to get that house in order so we could rent it out. Well, anyway, so when I moved down there, uh, this was about, well, it's been, it'll be two years in, in November, but anyway, uh, when one when one was uh, really sick, they sent him up to. I had to take him up to the hospital in Carmel, and he was uh, there to get a blood transfusion. They didn't let him out of the hospital. Well, anyway, my daughter and and, and Karen Orozco uh, were two of the people that were able to visit them visit him during the time that he was there at the hospital. In fact, initially, they allowed one person for one hour per day. But then towards the end of that week, they actually let a couple people in there. Um, uh, Monica and, and Karen were in there and said, Juan, do you actually want to stay here or do you want to go home? I want to go home. And they had given him two weeks to live. He comes to our house and, and people found out where he was staying. Fortunately, he was able to stay with me, and I was able to keep him, and he, he lived one week short of three months. And, and and that place, it was amazing. People from just all over were just in that in that house all the time. The, the bands, they came, you know, one thing they didn't say, the band came over, they brought their band, they were playing out in the front yard. We had 30 people out in our front yard just celebrating one's life. And, and when he would show, when people would show up, he wouldn't even let them ask, Juan, what are we, uh, what are we going to do? What do we need to do? Uh, no, um, do you, would you like us to bring you, what would you like us to bring? Do you need some help? Do you need something to bring? All Juan would do would be there and lecture the people for the next four or five hours. This is what we need to do. We need to do this and we need to do that and we got to get all this stuff organized for the memorial and for all these other things that are going on around here. He never put the eye on himself. It was always on everybody else. Anyway, he was an amazing person. Anybody here seen my old friend Abraham? Can you tell me where he's gone? 
read a lot of people, but the good they die young. I just look around and he's gone. Anybody here seen my old friend John? Can you tell me where he's gone? Read a lot of people, but the good they die young. I just look around and he's gone. Anybody here seen my old friend Martin? Can you tell me where he's gone? Read a lot of people, but the good they die young. I just look around and he's gone. Didn't you love the things that they stood for? And didn't they try? Find some good for you and me Someday we'll be free Someday I know Anybody here Seen my old friend Bobby Can you tell me where he's gone? Thought I saw him walking high upon the hill with Abraham, Martin, and John. Anybody here seen my old friend Juan? Can you tell me where he is gone? Thought I saw him walking high upon the hill with Abraham, Martin, Bobby, and John. Next, I'd like to have James uh, say a few words. Thank you, James, for allowing us to have this event here. Thank you. 